from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning and welcome one and all to the 10th annual National Book Festival. <clears throat> We're thr thrilled to be celebrating this milestone, <clears throat> excuse me, which we're calling a decade of words and wonder. And we're delighted to have all of you here celebrating it with us. And I expect many of you have been here for several of the festivals before. It gives me extraordinary pleasure this morning to introduce the person who was instrumental in bringing this unique and amazing event to all of us. I'm, of course, referring <coughs> to Laura Bush, who as First Lady <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> brought the concept of a national book festival to Washington from her home state of Texas, where she had conducted it with great time. <coughs> she co-hosted the national book festival throughout her years here on Pennsylvania Avenue. She's a former librarian, a champion of literacy. She's a teacher. She's an author of multiple books, including her latest, Spoken from the Heart. Madam First Lady, former First Lady, you speak to the heart of all of us. She'll do a reading from her book, then take questions. Microphones are on either side. Please keep your questions brief and on point. She honors us by taking a time out from an extraordinarily busy schedule, continuing involving her United Nations role, her role with UNESCO, her championship of reading, and many other good causes. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the woman I've been able to call, I think, with full force and with genuine conviction, Reader in Chief of the United States of America. Thank you all. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Bellington. Thank you for all your good work. Thank you for being such a great partner uh, for the National Book Festival. And thank you for continuing to build this National Book Festival. This is the 10th National Book Festival, which I think is so terrific. And I can see looking around this tent and all around the festival that it's uh, hugely popular with people from all over our country. So thank you all for coming and thank you for the warm welcome. I especially want to thank David Rubenstein, who's sitting here on the front row, for your generous gift. Uh, to the Library of Congress, will, will, which will ensure that the book festival will continue. Thank you very much, David. <clears throat> I love the National Book Festival, and I'm very happy to be here this year as an author. I spent most of my life surrounded by books. I was an avid reader as a child, my mother and I were regular fixtures at the Midland County Public Library, which was a magical place, not only because it housed thousands of books, but because it was in a basement, which was a very exotic place for West Texas. <laughs> Going to the library was the only time I ever got to go underground. I continued my love of books through college, through elementary school teaching in Dallas and Houston, through graduate school in library science, and then as a public librarian in Houston and a school librarian in Austin. I made a career out of my love for books. And to help spread that love, I helped to found the Texas Book Festival and then the National Book Festival. But while I love reading, I never thought I would write a book, certainly not one about myself. But as George's eight years in office drew to a close, publishers began calling, asking me when I was going to write a memoir. And I realized that there was, in fact, a lot I wanted to say. Our years in Washington, the first decade of the new century, were as consequential as almost any other time in our history. We lived through the most vicious attack on our homeland in the history of our nation. 
I was on Capitol Hill on the morning of September 11th, and in a minute, I'm gonna read you something about that. George and I cried with the grieving families, and we prayed with the nation. And we never forgot that day for the rest of his time in office, and we'll never forget it for the rest of our lives. I met so many of the brave men and women who volunteered to defend our country and who risk and give their lives so that the rest of us may, may never know terror again. And I've met the voices for freedom, like the former Czech president, Václav Havel, the great intellectual and playwright, who for years was imprisoned by the communist, but who never gave up his hopes for freedom. When the Iron Curtain fell, he stepped up to lead his country, and he's still speaking out on behalf of the oppressed. I met the Dalai Lama from Tibet and female candidates for parliament in Kuwait who ran for office in 2006, the first year that women there were granted the right to vote. And I met women in Afghanistan who under the Taliban could not leave their houses alone, who could not get an education, who would have their fingernails pulled off if they so much as wore a coat of fingernail polish. Now their lives are changing. In my book, I wanted to give voice to all of these remarkable people and to share these experiences with others. And I wanted to remember the many wonderful people I met here at home, the volunteers from the Red Cross and the Baptist men who drove all night to the storm-ravaged Gulf Coast after Katrina to cook meals for those in need and who stayed for months helping the people there rebuild. Are the brave Coast Guard volunteers who rescued some 30,000 people stranded after the hurricane struck. I wanted to tell of the days I spent with the young men in our cities and towns, many of whom were ex-gang members and who were trying to turn their lives around. I was never prouder than when, as part of my own Helping America's Youth initiative, I was able to welcome a group of ex-gang members from LA to the White House, the same house where we hosted the Queen of England and the Pope on his birthday. The more I thought about it, the more I realized that I had some great stories to tell, even about the great Easter egg caper at the 2006 Easter egg roll, where, well, if you want to know what happened in that story, I think I'll let you wait and read it in my book. <laughs> I had so many wonderful memories to share. Memories about the White House, stories about our life there, and about our families. And of course, many of my happiest and most enduring memories are of the National Book Festival. I remember something from each of the eight festivals I attended during our time at the White House. I remember talking with some of my favorite authors, with hosting Ludmilla Putin at the second book festival, with the National Basketball Association players who are our partners, the beautiful gala dinners, the wonderful co authors' coffees at the White House on the Saturday mornings, and so many more happy, happy memories. But I especially recall that first National Book Festival, September 8th, 2001. It was a magnificent day, sunny with a beautiful blue sky, just the kind of weather we had hoped from. Friends had come from around the country to stay with George and me at the White House. Over 40 friends came from Austin, all who had worked with me on the Texas Book Festival. I remember how patiently the festival goers had waited in line to meet their favorite authors. That first festival was everything we had hoped for and more. Three days later, our world changed. And since we're here in the history tent, I thought I'd read from my book a little bit that day that changed our world. Tuesday morning, September 11th, was sunny and warm, the sky brilliant cerulean blue. My friends who had come for the National Book Festival had all flown home, and even George was gone in Florida for a school visit. 
George H.W. Bush and Barr had spent the night, but they'd already left on a 7 a.m. plane to catch an early flight. And I had what I considered a big day planned. I was set to arrive at the Capitol at 9.15 to brief the Senate Education Committee, chaired by Edward M. Kennedy, on the findings of Early Childhood Development Conference that I'd held in July. In the afternoon, we were hosting the entire Congress and their families for the annual congressional picnic. The south lawn of the White House was already covered with picnic tables awaiting their fluttering cloths. And Tom Perini from Buffalo Gap, Texas, was setting up his chuck wagons. Our entertainment would be old-fashioned square dancing and Texas swing music by Ray Benson and his classic band, Asleep at the Wheel. I finished dressing in silence, going over my statement again in my mind. I was very nervous about appearing before a Senate committee and having news cameras trained on me. Had the TV been turned on, I might have heard the first fleeting report of a plane hitting the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Instead, it was the head of my Secret Service detail, Ron Sprinkle, who leaned over and whispered the news in my ear as I entered the car a few minutes after 9 a.m. Andy Ball, my chief of staff at the White House, domestic policy advisor Margaret Spellings, and I speculated on what could have happened. A small plane, maybe, a Cessna, running into one of those massive towers on this beautiful September morning. We were driving up Pennsylvania Avenue when word came that the South Tower had been hit. The car fell silent. We sat in mute disbelief. One plane might be a strange accident. Two planes were clearly an attack. I thought about George and wondered if the Secret Service had already hustled him to the motorcade and begun the race to Air Force One to return home. Two minutes later, at 9.16 a.m., we pulled up to the entrance of the Russell Building. In the time it had taken to drive the less than two minutes between the white, two miles between the White House and the Capitol, the world as I knew it had changed. Senator Kennedy was waiting to greet me. We both knew when we met that the towers had been hit and without a word being spoken, we knew that there would be no briefing that morning. Together, we walked the short distance to his office. He began by presenting me with a limited edition print. It was a vase of bright daffodils, a copy of a painting he had created for his wife, Victoria, and given to her on their wedding day. The print was inscribed to me and dated September 11th, 2001. An old television was turned on in a corner of the room and I glanced over to see the plumes of smoke billowing from the Twin Towers. Senator Kennedy kept his eyes averted from the screen. Instead, he led me on a tour of his office, pointing out various pictures, furniture, pieces of memorabilia, even a framed note that his brother Jack had sent to their mother when he was a child, in which he wrote, Teddy is getting fat. The senator, who would outlive all his brothers by more than 40 years, laughed at the note as he showed it to me, still finding it amusing. All the while, I kept glancing over at the glowing television screen. My skin was starting to crawl. I wanted to leave to find out what was going on, to process what I was seeing, but I felt trapped in an endless cycle of pleasantries. It did not occur to me to say, Senator Kennedy, what about the towers? I simply followed his lead, and he may have feared that if, he actually, if we actually began to contemplate what had happened in New York, I might dissolve into tears. Senator Judd Gregg of New Hampshire, the ranking Republican on the committee, and one of our very good friends, Judd had played Al Gore for George during mock debates at the ranch that previous fall, arrived just as I was completing the tour. Senator Kennedy invited us to sit on the couches as he continued chatting about anything other than the horrific images unfolding on the tiny screen across the room. I looked around his shoulder but could see very little, and I was still trying to pay attention to him and to the thread of his conversation. It seemed completely unreal, sitting in this elegant sunlit office as an immense tragedy unfolded. We sat as human beings driven by smoke, flame, and searing heat jumped from the tops of the Twin Towers 
to end their lives. And his firemen in full gear began the climb up the tower's stairs. I've often wondered if the small talk that morning was Ted Kennedy's defense mechanism. If, after so much tragedy, the combat death of his oldest brother in World War II, the assassinations of his brother Jack and Robert, and the deaths of nephews, including John Jr., whose body he identified when it was pulled from the cold, dark waters off Martha's Vineyard. If, after all those things, he simply could not look upon another grievous tragedy. At about 9.45, after George had made a brief statement to the nation, which we watched clustered around a small television that was perched on the receptionist's desk, Ted Kennedy, Judd Gregg, and I walked out to tell reporters that my briefing had been postponed. I said, you heard from the president this morning, and Senator Kennedy and Senator Gregg and I join his statement in saying that our hearts and our prayers go out to the victims of this act of terrorism and that our support goes to the rescue workers. And all of our prayers are with everyone there right now. As I turn to exit, Lawrence McQuillan of USA Today asked a question. Mrs. Bush, you know children are kind of struck by all this. Is there a message you could tell to the nations? I didn't even wait for him to finish, but began. Parents need to reassure their children everywhere in our country that they're safe. As we walked out of the briefing room, the cell phone of my advance man, John Myers, rang. A friend told him that CNN was reporting that an airplane had crashed into the Pentagon. Within minutes, the order given to evacuate, an order would be given to evacuate the White House and the Capitol. The Secret Service had decided to take me temporarily to their headquarters, located in a nondescript federal office building a few blocks from the White House. Following the Oklahoma City bombing, their offices had been reinforced to survive a large-scale blast. Outside our convoy windows, the city streets were clogged with people evacuating their workplaces. In the time I reached my motorcade, Flight 93 had crashed into a Pennsylvania field, and the west side of the Pentagon had begun to collapse. In the intervening years, Senator Judd Gregg and I and many others were left to contemplate what if Flight 93 had not been forced down by its passengers into an empty field? What if shortly after 10 a.m. it had reached the Capitol Dome? Walking through the hallways at the Secret Service building, I saw a sign emblazoned with the emergency number 911. Had the terrorists thought about our iconic number when they picked this date and planned an emergency so overwhelming? For a while, I sat in a small office area off the conference room, silently watching the images on television. I watched the replay as the South Tower of the World Trader Trade Center roared with sound and then collapsed into a silent gray plume, offering my personal prayer to God to receive the victims with open arms. The North Tower had given way live in front of my eyes sending some 1,500 souls and 110 stories of gypsum and concrete buckling to the ground. Inside Secret Service headquarters, I asked my staff to call their families, and I called my girls who had been whisked away by Secret Service agents to secure locations. In Austin, Jenna had been awakened by an agent pounding on her dorm door. In her room at Yale, Barbara had heard another student sobbing uncontrollably a few doors down. Then I called my mother because I wanted her to know that I was safe and I wanted so much to hear the sound of her voice. Late in the afternoon, we got word that the president was returning to Washington. At 6.30, we got in a Secret Service caravan to drive to the White House. I gazed out the window. The city had taken on the cast of an abandoned movie set the sun was shining, but the streets were deserted. We couldn't see a person on the sidewalk or any vehicles driving on the street. There was no sound at all except for our, uh, the roll of wheels over the ground. By 7.30, we were on our way up to the residence. I have no memory of having eaten dinner, 
George may have eaten on the plane. He tried to call the girls as soon as we were upstairs, but couldn't reach them. Barbara called back close to 8 p.m., and then George left to make remarks to the nation. We did finally climb into our own bed that night, exhausted and emotionally drained. Outside the doors of the residence, the Secret Service details stood in their usual posts. I fell asleep, but it was a light, fitful rest, and I could feel George staring into the darkness beside me. Then I heard a man screaming as he ran, Mr. President, Mr. President, you've got to get up. The White House is under attack. We jumped up and I grabbed a robe and stuck my feet into my slippers, but I didn't stop to put on my contacts. George grabbed Barney and I grabbed Kitty. With Spot trailing behind, we started walking down to the Piak. George had wanted to take the elevator, but the agents didn't think it was safe. And so we had to descend flight after flight of stairs to the state floor, then the ground floor, and below, while I held George's hand because I couldn't see anything. My heart was pounding and all I could do was count stairwell landings, trying to count off in my mind how many more floors we had to go. When we reached the Piak, I saw the outline of a military aide unfolding the ancient hideaway bed and putting on some sheets. At that moment, another agent ran up to us and said, Mr. President, it's one of our own. The plane was one of ours. For months afterwards at night in bed, we'd hear the military jets thundering overhead, traveling so fast that the ground below quivered and shook. They'd make one pass and then three or five minutes later make another low fine loop. I'd fall asleep to the roar of the fighters in the sky, hearing in my mind those words, one of our own. There was a quiet security in that, in knowing that we slept between the watchful eyes of one of our own. And then just a little closing sentence from the second book festival in 2002. Many moments from that day stayed with me, but a particular note were the closing remarks by the historian David McCullough, in which he described John Adams' quest for knowledge. In quotes, the greatest gift of all, he was certain, was the gift of an inquiring mind. McCullough quoted Adams saying, and I quote, I have the liberty to think for myself. And then David McCullough added, we face a foe today who believes in enforced ignorance. We don't. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Now we have time for questions. We have a few minutes for questions. I like your Charlotte's Web t-shirt. You know I am the grandniece of E.B. White who wrote Charlotte's Web. Oh, really? Yes. Great. And, <laughs> and two, years, two years ago, when you and Jenna were signing your books, we talked, and you both signed my book. And I do E.B. White presentations, mm -hmm. and I always bring your book and oh, show great. them and talk about on your page where you reference Charlotte's Web. Mm -hmm. And I thank you so much for that children's book. It's wonderful. But this is also a wonderful, wonderful book. And thank you for writing thank it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. What was your exact feeling when you found out that you were attacked by one of your own? And no, we weren't attacked by one of our own. We were covered by one of our own. They were protecting us. This was a, um, the plane that I was talking about were the military cap that flew over Washington. They were United States military. So we were protected by them. And that gave me a great feeling of security. What was your favorite part about being the host of the National Book Festival? Well, I love seeing so many happy people here. Uh, so many people that love to read. And I think there's something that book lovers all share. Uh, no matter what our political views might be or what our differences might be of any kind, we all love books, uh, we all love reading, and we especially appreciate that we have so many tremendous American authors, uh, that, that we have such a huge body of literature uh, to choose from, from our own writers and then of course from writers around the world, but especially children. 
we have a really wonderful huge body of children's literature in the United States and as an old retired children's librarian I'm really proud of that thank you, thank you. one more I think good morning um, who are your, some of your favorite authors of the last five or ten years and what are you reading now um, right now I'm reading um, Cutting for Stone by Abraham Verghese. He was, he's a, he was a Texas Book Festival writer before with uh, one of his books. I don't know if he um, has been a National Book Festival writer, but it's terrific. It's a um, gr great book about twins, but also about Ethiopia. Uh, then I read, and this was one of the books given to me by booksellers on my book tour, My Name is Mary Souter historical fiction about the Civil War, uh, really great, by Robin Oliveira, and so I recommend both of those. George is reading the new biography about Bonhoeffer, that's the title, Bonhoeffer, and I can't wait to get my hands on it and read it next. So I'm usually reading the newest books by book festival authors. I'll be at the Texas Book Festival um, in uh, late October for them um, also, and so I hope any of you that have a chance can also come there for the Texas Book Festival. Thank you all very much. I think my time is up. I appreciate it very, very much. Thank you all. God bless you all. Thanks a lot. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.